Hello, everyone, and welcome to Live Academy, the virtual design learning platform by Meal Middle East Architecture Lab. My name is Riyad Jokra. I'm joining from Dubai, and I'll be moderating today's public lecture by Young and Ayata. Today's lecture is uh, part of semester three, but we have other lectures in line in our schedule. So I became familiar with the work of Young and Ayata through their writings, and I was particularly interested in their work uh, post uh, them winning the Bauhaus Museum um, competition through their project, The Vessel Collective. So I'm very looking forward that uh, they share some of the process behind that project. Young and Ayata formed a partnership in New York in 2008 to explore the conceptual and aesthetic possibilities of architecture and urbanism. Michael Young is an assistant professor at the Erwin S. Channon School of Architecture at the Cooper Union. He is the recipient of the 2019-2020 uh, Rome Prize uh, from the American Academy of Rome. Formerly, he is a visiting uh, assistant professor at Princeton University and visiting lecturer at SIAC. In the fall of 2016, he was uh, the Louis Kahn visiting assistant professor at Yale University. Michael received his Master of Architecture from Princeton University and his Bachelor of Architecture from Cal Poly uh, San uh, Luis uh, Ospiso. Michael is a registered architect at the State of New York. Uh, Kutan Ayata is an associate professor and the vice chair at the Department of Architecture and Urbanism at UCLA. He previously held teaching positions at the University of Pennsylvania, Pratt Institute, City College of New York, Cornell University, and Columbia University. He received his Master of Architecture from Princeton University and his Bachelor of Fine Arts from Massachusetts College of Art. He's a registered architect at the Chamber of Architects in Turkey. Everyone, I'm very excited uh, to welcome uh, Michael Young and Kutan Ayata from Young and Ayata to Live Academy for this one hour public lecture. Welcome to uh, this session. Thanks, Riyad. That was great. Uh, we're super happy to be here. Thanks for inviting us. Uh, happy to share the work. Uh, let's get going. So we got about six projects and we're gonna bounce back and forth between uh, Kutan and myself uh, in terms of who's Kind of leading the discussion, but as a mode of introduction, we're going to start with this. So, uh, what you're looking at is an Instagram post from a company named Dada Daily. And Dada Daily is in the business of selling objects and things that have a connection to the surrealist movement, connections to the kind of absurdities of modern life, which was the Dada at the start of the 20th century. This was sent to us by a former employee of, of ours, Morris Seagull. And the reason she sent it to us was not because of what Dada Daily was selling, because Dada Daily is selling this in this image. It's a candle, a candle in the shape of a hand. You light the fingers. You can light all the fingers except for one finger. And this is their product. And they're selling it via this image. Why Morris sent it to us and why we were interested in it is because of the image that they put the candle into, this 17th century Dutch still life. And the reason we're interested in that image that they had put their product into was because it was related to a series of projects that we had done at Young and Ayata. Initially, it starts with things like this. About a decade ago, we were starting the office, we were starting teaching, and we did a number of different experiments, self-driven experiments, to try to understand the tools and technologies of mediation that we were engaged in. So we wanted to understand this case, um, the geometry, which was behind uh, NURBS curvature in Rhino. And so we've, we developed a method of turning off the curves and turning on all the tangents and normals, all the geometry, which was there driving the ways in which the curves were being rendered for our visual consumption on our screens. And uh, through that began to develop a series of aesthetic experiments within lines as painterly marks meaning that we are much more interested in questions of depth, questions of vibration, questions of optics, questions of the ways in which we could use the tools to expose not only the ways in, in which they are operating, but the alternate possibilities for them as design instruments. So things like this then became applied to things like this. These are digital fabrications, uh, fabrications in which we're looking at questions of ornament and decoration and how they relate to the formal description and geometry of a vase, of a vessel in this case. And specifically, we are interested in how digital fabrication could be used to create effects that were in excess of the materiality of the powder in which it was being printed. 
meaning that if we could control the articulation, the way in which the decoration, ornament, coloration, uh, texture uh, could describe and imply effects of luminosity, of materiality, of an origin other than its uh, powder and its full color powder print, we could start to think about these things as real, meaning that we could start to question the ways in which digital fabrication becomes real, becomes an object in our daily life. So these vases were the physical output of that exploration. And then we tested it in a different manner. And we tested them by jacking them into 17th century Dutch still lifes. So we'll see a few of those examples here. 17th century Dutch still lifes, by the way, are pretty amazing things. I don't know if you can pick up on it, but there's a, a peeled lemon in each of these. There's turned over glasses. There's uh, crustaceans, which are upside down. There's questions of luminosity of reflection, of the ways in which light is caught and held within different materials. None of this stuff is the way in which one just walks away from a table. No one just got up from uh, their breakfast and left this lobster there uh, with, a, with a little sword and a pewter vase and an unfurled lemon and an oyster. Um, they're pretty real. They are in and of themselves a genre which explores and tries to question what it is to paint a real version of the description of the world. Uh, and so in this, they are a kind of conversation amongst themselves, amongst the genre of still life painters, but also a conversation that the painter is working on in the description of reality by uh, how and in which ways they paint the objects that are put into place. So what you're looking at is a still life that we did, Young and Ayala. And this is what uh, Dada Daily used for their image. They jacked their hand a uh, candle into our image of this still life. So uh, we sent him a message like, hey, uh, thanks for using our still life. That's cool. Can we use it in the lectures? And they had no idea. It became even uh, more clear when uh, I asked them a few more questions and they didn't even notice it, which is fine, by the way. We don't care. That's like, uh, you know, better than we could even possibly imagine that they would put their thing into the thing that we had put our thing into, which in, the, in a way was already an image that was created out of the recycling of multiple layers of different forms of the real as an image. Now, all this may sound a little odd, a little esoteric, but we're living in a world in which uh, how we consume the ways in which reality looks is done through mediated montaged images. We know this, we're on, we're on Zoom all the time these days. We're consuming most of our information through our digital screens that we either have on our laptops or carry around in our pockets. Um, this is a reality which is created out of different uh, combinations and assemblages of images as objects. And so in a number of manners, in a number of ways, what was happening with the Dada 100 years ago, what was happening with the Dutch still life uh, 400 years ago, and what's happening with uh, Instagram in our digital mediations today as image machines recycling the refuse of cultural production is in line with a way of thinking about how we model reality through images. So what we'd like to do now is share six projects from Yaman Ayala, and each in their own way tackles or addresses or deals with some sort of question about the ways in which we as architects engage in and question the appearance of the background of reality and where our responsibilities are to ask that that can be other than we assume it to be and hopefully uh, create the possibility that worlds for, for our occupation can be other than we assume it to be. So with that, uh, All right, um, we're going to jump back and forth here uh, between the different projects and uh, start um, you know, through small objects and scale up towards uh, larger ones uh, in WRT. Um, we were invited to uh, participate uh, in the kind of Chicago Architecture Biennale in 2015 uh, by Volume Gallery. Um, we were asked to uh, design an object uh, for the solo exhibition. Um, there, I'm really uh, interested in the idea of a vase, um, how an object kind of can become a background uh, to a staged um, stage thing, in this case, the flower. The aesthetics of the flower is rather interesting, 
something that we do without really questioning uh, severing a reproduction organ of a plant um, and enjoy its love that um, while we contemplate its beauty. So within that, uh, there's a tension between what's being presented and uh, what's holding that presentation. So what we came up with um, uh, is a um, is a vase that uh, in in some way tried to um, um, kind of hold the flower in such a way and in different ways and configure in ways that the distinction between uh, what's foreground and what's background perhaps disappears. In some ways, the flower begins to become part of the vase. The vase begins to perform depending on its orientation uh, and its uh, capacity to tumble. Uh, begins to enter uh, different postures uh, hand in hand with the flowers. But what it was is uh, four different containers that are oriented in different directions, defining uh, these nozzles, with a fifth one defining the skin that's holding all the rest and with its cavity holding uh, further water. So you could potentially uh, imagine this is one uh, ways that's uh, five different ways in itself, this capacity to hold. Um, you know, in five different configurations, and depending on the com combinations, whether it's holding on uh, twos or threes, uh, it begins to uh, kind of uh, multiply the way in which it can present itself. So it's a way that begins to tumble uh, in turn. Um, from outside, though, it's held all within a skin, uh, begins to produce, um, I, I guess, other uh, kind of aesthetic kind of uh, uh, affiliations akin to almost like an um, um, animal body. We call them headless chickens, we call them uh, rolling ducks, uh, and other things. Um, and we produce them in uh, different mater materials, uh, ranging from um, you know, ABS prints to, um, to resin, uh, all produced through 3D printing. But again, just like the vases uh, Michael talked about a little earlier, um, kind of through post-processing, uh, our ambition was to kind of go beyond the material that makes them and begins to begin to produce other qualities uh, that you can associate with the fabrication uh, that has made them. Um, they had the capacity to soldier on, they had the capacity to cuddle, they had uh, kind of capacities to move beyond how one might typically present uh, a flower. Within that, we kind of found an opportunity uh, to hide fabricated flowers that would operate through qualities of flowerness. What are the colors that we could work with? What are the um, kind of forms that we could artific artificially produce uh, within 3D uh, printing techniques through powder that could hide in there as, let's say, either dead flowers or we could also call them perhaps uh, fake flowers. These fake flowers in some way uh, made you pay attention um, uh, to the project, uh, not directly, uh, but in perhaps uh, through a second visit. You could easily pass by these things uh, as uh, as real things uh, that are with harmony with what one might call real nature, uh, but only upon close uh, attention you discover the kind of oddities, the kind of maybe uh, uh, the differences uh, and unexpected qualities what might encounter. encounter. Uh, upon close examination. And they, you know, they're carefully cura curated in terms of their color, composition, form to kind of produce a quality of, uh, I guess, floweriness, but radically differentiating upon close inspection again uh, from those traits toward, uh, towards artificial constructs. And there are five different species that we produced. What was interesting to us to go uh, maybe more into this fiction as part of the exhibition, we uh, kind of named these, you know, named these species, of course, in Latin, but also uh, kind of zoomed in uh, to their construction, zoomed in at a scale that's only possible perhaps uh, within our computers, our endless kind of space of uh, discovery and exploration of detail in which we could begin to give properties to how these things are made. And only at that scale, we begin to kind of push the level of artificiality uh, of these geometries to an extreme where perhaps their fakeness, uh, their uh, constructions of geometry became uh, clearly, clearly artificial, which hopefully in return made me look back, made you look back 
uh, to the flowers more carefully to recognize uh, what you accept it to be real and what you ex accept it to be kind of authentic to prove uh, to be a synthetic construction. The next project is another project that was for a gallery, this time for the Sire Gallery. And it was an invited competition, or not competition, invited uh, exhibition where a number of architects were asked to explore ways in which computation and digital fabrication were affecting the detail. So there was a number of architects invited and some just fabulous work was, was displayed. Uh, up here in the front row, just to give you a few of the people that were there, were Neil Denari and, and Frank Gehry and Greg Lynn and uh, Tom Main Amorphosis. We're the one in the in the very back corner that's kind of highlighted. And we took a maybe a slightly different stance on what would be a way to examine the contemporary detail through digital fabrication. We wanted to look at what was the most mundane, the most common, the most banal detail that was there hiding within the corners, the edges, the trims, the moldings of contemporary modern construction. So we looked at the Fry Riglet wall reveal, that detail which is there to catch the mud and the, and the paste and the paint of the chipboard wall to uh, provide an edge that the, the trim can back up against to basically in a way expose the molding so that the molding doesn't have to cover or conceal the detail but in that, abstract out the detail so that it is just a shadow line. And in effect, creates a wall as an abstraction. Because the wall is now no longer a symbol, the wall is just floating there. Now these fry reglet wall reveal details, if you haven't looked at them, they come in, in J's and L's and H's, and uh, they're pretty weird in and of themselves. They're kind of fascinating, the different conditions that these deal with in terms of size, shape, uh, porosity, uh, corners, beads, all the different things you can think of, they have a, an extrusion to deal with. So these were ours. Uh, we 3D printed a whole set of different reveal details that we were going to jack into the assembly of the most standard wall construction we possibly could. And so it had to be straight up standard to uh, US wood frame construction. These are two by tens hung with uh, Simpson joist hangers. It's half inch uh, jipboard double for the fire rating, uh, two by four studs. Um, all of it has to be straight up normal. And it's only in the interior corner where two walls and a ceiling meet that our details would begin to intervene. Now that's a kind of a weird spot anyway. It's, it's a hard corner to detail always the internal corner of uh, three surfaces meeting. And that is where we would put our emphasis. So since there was four corners, we developed four details. In each of these details, to try to do something slightly different in terms of um, how one read the intersections of the walls. So in some cases, the, the one on the left here, we tried to pull that corner back into the thickness of the wall cavity, into the post shape, as if there was an infin infinite uh, recession of space that happened within the material construction. The one on the right uh, pulls up the reveal and allows the verticality of the corner intersection to pass up through the horizontality of the ceiling. And then a kind of flourish, a kind of ornamental flourish, attract attention, kind of frame out, uh, surround that moment of juncture between the three surfaces. The third one here on the left puts all the pressure on that point. Ultimately, the intersection of three surfaces is the intersection of three lines, and that uh, resolves itself into a point. So the detail here was to kind of bulbously push out to uh, create a concave surface, which would then allow all of the focus to be situated into that point itself. Now, these first three, I think, uh, we think would in many ways kind of sit within the history of ornament. They call attention to themselves. They are things that want you to look at and consider uh, their form, their material, their, their uh, figure, their condition, their installation in a longer mode. And this is the question of attention that Kutan was just talking about with the flowers. This fourth one, um, which is the one we actually became the most interested in in the end, is slightly different. So it's a very simple detail. It's just a detail that tapers. But what it produces is it produces a feeling that the walls are wrong 
that the walls are racked, that the walls are twisting or turning. I assure that they are not. They are still vertical and horizontal planes. But the detail changes one's attention to that space itself. So that in, an, in its installation, one no longer looks at the detail as an ornament signifying some focus or some importance, but begins to think that the entire room could be off or other than one assumes it to be. So we tested it out in a rendering as well. And in this case, we just appropriated a rendering that we found on the internet. And we did two things to it. Um, the rendering, by the way, is pretty banal. We like the fact that we can sometimes just grab banality and begin to intervene in it. And the two things are, we inserted a sculpture to draw one's attention away from the fact that most of our effort went into the visualization of how that one detail, that fourth detail, uh, would begin to affect the overall condition of the walls. And in that way, begin to allow attention to shift towards the overlooked background uh, and hopefully intensify and elongate one's relationships to one's environment. All right, um, into the building. Um, this is a project we do a lot with uh, um, Isaac Michan and Michan Architecture in Mexico City. Uh, it's called DL uh, 1310 Apartments. Um, so the project is located in the uh, southwest of uh, Mexico City um, in a, a middle income neighborhood uh, for a speculative mid market uh, residential project. Um, the site is um, on a hilly, narrow residential street, uh, which has been recently opened to uh, new uh, zoning through zoning regulations to um, new development. Um, and you can kind of see the um, recent residue uh, being registered, uh, all buildings being built uh, uh, to full plot lines, uh, sharing a party wall, uh, having a frontage uh, to the street uh, and back to, uh, to the valley that's uh, sloping down away uh, from the site. Um, within the zoning regulations, uh, we found um, a possibility to set back uh, from the site, which uh, in return awarded uh, one extra floor uh, to the um, the project. Um, in return, our ambition was to really think about how we could uh, occupy this uh, kind of potentially future narrow opening between two fully built um, neighbors and allow the side of the building uh, to produce oblique views towards the valley and towards the street without necessarily looking onto um, other uh, other neighboring buildings. Um, and all our focus, uh, all our attention here uh, had to be what the aperture could be, uh, both in the front and on the sides, um, within a building that just had to be a box, uh, given the tight zoning footprints um, and the uh, um, kind of limits one has in uh, residential architecture at this type uh, and this scale. Um, so the building in its footprint is uh, just a regular box, uh, and all its effort goes towards defining um, what a window can do uh, by shifting out of plane. Uh, there is only one uh, move, uh, I guess one move that results in uh, two different kinds of uh, details uh, and two different kinds of condition that it produces, which then uh, resonates uh, in multiple ways uh, within the organization of the um, plan, uh, but also in the way it begins to alter the nature of the space uh, that originates from a fairly generic uh, layout. Um, so it's a rectangular window that tilts uh, out of plane, and it results uh, one way to a leftover trapezoid uh, that is squeezed between two roof surfaces, and the other one is a, a curving vertical wall, wall um, if the option wasn't transparency uh, but opacity. Um, so ultimately, uh, you have uh, uh, two conditions that are defining uh, as they're distributed uh, around the building, uh, various conditions uh, with regards to the plan. The plan, as I said, is a fairly simple plan. Um, two bedroom apartments in the back, uh, one bedroom apartments in the front, total of seven apartments, uh, one duplex at the bottom. And you begin to see the effect of these negative uh, corners, we call them uh, negative bay windows, windows that 
instead of uh, projecting out, begin to kind of push in, rotate into the space, beginning to, um, I guess, uh, subdivide or reorient one's um, uh, condition uh, within a rectangular kind of space in a multitude of ways. Uh, we'll get into that in just a little bit. Some of these windows uh, begin to push deeper into the um, spaces on the site, um, mostly the bedrooms, sometimes uh, the bathrooms, allowing natural light to come in deeper without having them facing a potential future neighbor um, uh, neighbor wall or neighbor facade uh, that's going to be uh, close to them. And in the back, the project is uh, wide open to the valley uh, through a more transparent uh, condition. Um, this though uh, was, was kind of a, uh, kind of it, it pushed us to think a little differently about aperture. Was aperture, uh, was it a hole that you made on a surface or could we understood aperture, uh, a condition in which the slab kind of pinned and thickened out through its articulation um, that allowed aperture to just occur uh, between these uh, manipulations. Um, the Making the aperture became kind of the single mo more most important part of the project. Uh, we have five different sizes. Uh, we had to rethink um, within the given budget how we could um, use these uh, molds, um, how we could uh, kind of make this, how we understand its geometry, uh, how do we reuse, how we effectively kind of really uh, confront, confront the realities of how this is built, uh, both within a certain time frame. Uh, but also within the techniques that are available to us in terms of um, what could be uh, implemented in Mexico. Obviously, there's a very strong um, concrete culture. There's great expertise. Um, and what we could tease out of that uh, could be kind of an important part of the project. The first um, kind of attempts um, at kind of trying to be economical and very straightforward uh, resulted in a mold work. Uh, in which uh, we just staggered to establish the root surfaces um, to cast the concrete. But we quickly kind of realized the more corners uh, you produce, uh, given the uh, kind of um, uh, quality of concrete, uh, the more breakage, the more uh, kind of problems you're going to have as you release the formwork. Plus, uh, doing this would require for us to build the formwork every time we had an instance, uh, out of which we had about uh, 40 instances of um, rural surfaces within the project. Then we looked at uh, other precedents, other uh, kind of um, examples of how rural surfaces were constructed and this expertise to um, board form um, in, in the way it established the rural surfaces uh, could show us the way, especially in the work of Candela, where the you know, um, these incredible surfaces uh, were built with um, kind of local expertise and knowledge when it comes to form, uh, form work making, um, but also the qualities that comes out of the um, registration of the boards uh, were something that we were really interested in showing the directionality of uh, the surface. So what we ended up doing um, is to produce uh, the positive um, uh, through this expertise of the uh, wood formworks out of which uh, we extracted uh, polycarbonate, caribbean lightweight molds that we could uh, reuse from cast to cast, both at the bottom of the cast, but also uh, at the top. And what was interesting is uh, the polycarbonate also registered uh, through the application, uh, kind of, let's say the, uh, the grains and lines and uh, I guess the woodiness of wood uh, onto its uh, synthetic surface. And with that, we started to uh, kind of test it uh, through various mock-ups. The critical thing here was how to get a monolithic cast, uh, because if you were to cast this in a series of, um, um, I guess, steps, you would end up with cold joints, which would go against uh, kind of the desires of the monolithic quality we were trying to get um, uh, that we achieved within the, within the renderings. But the construction technique and uh, how we're trying to um, really build this is contemplating, you know, various other forces beyond um, the image that we first produced, but always working towards that image um, to kind of produce that quality of um, monolithic um, um, definition. Um, so this whole one piece is cast uh, 
all at once. Uh, and that ended up being kind of the sequence of tour where we would kind of um, somehow managed to get the concrete uh, within and under the uh, polycarbonate, uh, but also through the vertical surfaces uh, above the slab all at once. And then we would sister in the upper portion into this uh, that would be integrated with the upper floors cast. Um, this is our final uh, mock-up before the construction actually started, where we're testing horizontal lines versus vertical lines. This is the moment where we're kind of uh, trying to really um, um, you know, kind of see how the window can fit in, um, how if we had to go to a cold joint, whether the horizontal lines would work. Um, and uh, we reverted back to vertical lines here uh, for all vertical surfaces and curved uh, surfaces uh, that were extrusions. And then the construction started. And for all the digital fabrication, uh, for all the kind of specificity that we try to um, achieve within uh, our virtual environments, the construction technique that built this thing um, is probably 150 years old. Um, it is uh, a totally ordered chaos in some way where you have things that have been digitally fabricated, kind of sistered in. Um, um, this guy is standing right on uh, one of those fiberglass molds, sistered in into kind of concrete casting processes that are absolutely primitive. Like looking at this, it's hard to imagine a degree of precision would come out of it. But somehow, uh, you know, it, it, it began to come out and it began to come out um, in some way um, like as greedy as uh, we imagined um, and um, kind of conditions um, around sharp edges uh, or moments in which the roof surface meets the um, uh, regular cast uh, begin to emerge um, quite, quite successfully. And the buildings start jumping in. We kind of start to see, you know, kind of the effects that we were after in terms of um, kind of direction of the wood, uh, the kind of uh, relief of the surface and the way the boards move in and out to produce a rough edge. Uh, and we were welcoming all these uh, kind of uh, rough conditions because the rougher the sur surface became, uh, uh, by the introduction of the glass, uh, we would hope that, um, that that contrast would begin to produce uh, equality. The whole building on the street front began to kind of present itself uh, rather differently than the residential buildings that you see uh, in the neighborhood, windows looking away from the facade, uh, sitting on the volcanic rock. Um, There's a very common construction material um, around here. Um, and windows, uh, the trapezoid window, depending on how you move around, begin to present itself um, sometimes as rest rectangles, sometimes as trapezoids that um, kind of vanished away from you. And in other views, um, uh, it begins to kind of um, um, uh, recede kind of smaller, I guess, uh, in its far end, depending on your distance. Um, and all the windows and concrete kind of held within this kind of steel detail uh, that acts as a liner. Um, to kind of frame out uh, the window. But kind of interesting qualities here that we begin to uh, kind of experience is looking uh, into the building, through the building, out the building, seeing from the depths of the site, uh, perhaps moments of the street that we just uh, came from. Um, and this is, these are some uh, finished images uh, looking up. Um, you can see kind of the same detail distributing itself um, from, um, from various heights to kind of, uh, it, 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 I guess, uh, kind of doesn't organize itself according to any structural logic. Uh, the skin is the structure in this case. The, the facade carries the building as well as it envelopes the building. Uh, given the kind of climate, it also uh, doesn't deal uh, with questions of assembly and layering for thermal uh, insulation. Uh, what you get is the building inside and out. You have glass, steel, and concrete, uh, even though it's finished differently on the inside. Um, but the facade performs, um, you know, as its kind of architectural uh, definition, structure, um, and envelope all all at once. Um, the maybe the most kind of uh, unexpected discovery for us. And I think we're happy to say this is uh, kind of uh, unexpected uh, because you don't get to see this or you don't kind of render it uh, to this level of specificity uh, as you design. 
is a transformation of the window once you move from outside in. Uh, from outside, um, the building kind of aims to be uh, aims to produce a very deep facade through the kind of tinted dark glass and frame, almost dub doubling itself uh, to the reflection onto itself, to something that becomes very airy and light from the inside. But because the big window gets backlit uh, and the small one doesn't, the small rectangular windows all of a sudden becomes kind of a strange object literally sitting um, in the middle of the room. Because of the detail um, within the concrete section, the frame of the large trapezoid hides behind uh, the soffit. Um, what we feared uh, was the corner column completely disappears uh, into the body of the uh, rectangular window. The effect of this uh, window, we always thought along the lines of Robert Simmons, uh, Simmonson's uh, in anthropobic chambers, the one that um, kind of allows you to kind of move in and makes your eyeballs split into two directions through the mirror and allows you to see uh, two different directions uh, and makes you go one way or another. And we always thought these windows could uh, act in a similar way, dividing the space in a way where you could kind of um, either come close attention to it, uh, move one way or another, uh, and the kind of generic layout of a rectangle could uh, divide in some way. So kind of experience from outside of the monolith uh, becomes fairly open uh, from the inside. These are single pane um, kind of windows here that uh, don't really appear to be there, uh, but they're definitely there. But it's that tension between the window uh, that presents itself uh, as a dark rectangle uh, that makes the other one uh, disappear. Uh, um, you shots again, uh, kind of looking out, looking in, um, and the way the corners are turned allows you to experience the narrow street, uh, both frontally, uh, but also in its uh, kind of long direction, depending on where you see. And the deeper windows that push into the um, side of the building, again, allow you to um, kind of um, look obliquely uh, towards the uh, street and towards the valley in the back. Um, and the orientations and reflections that are working uh, to present this kind of facade, again, as I mentioned earlier, doesn't really reside in um, kind of any kind of organizational logic of uh, structure or composition. In some way, they're very opportunistic in the way. Um, we made them when we had to make them, depending on the plan uh, and how we wanted to orient them towards the front um, or the back. So this quality of um, kind of um, this heavy object begins to uh, kind of maybe lighten up as the time uh, kind of moves towards the night. Um, and at night, it becomes fairly uh, kind of open structure um, and kind of, I guess, becomes um, kind of antithesis of what it is uh, during the day in the way it filters the um, light out. Um, and I think finally, uh, this is how we sit in the context. And um, in some way, through its form, it doesn't make a, a gesture to call attention to itself. Uh, it operates at the scale of all other new buildings. Um, it, it doesn't kind of uh, tries to then I jump out uh, by large formal um, conditions, but it does uh, kind of, as you get closer to it, uh, the kind of scalar shift in its apertures, uh, the different ways in which the apertures are articulated, begins to really define a different possibility for uh, what architectural at the scale at this type uh, could be like. Okay, jumping up in scale, to a competition entry for uh, a concert hall in Kaunas, Lithuania from a, from a couple of years ago, from 2017. And this was a project that was along a river, across the river from the historic uh, town center of Kaunas, and along a kind of industrial stretch. So the site itself had not been developed. Um, down the river was a concrete plant, and across the river was this historic district. And how we began to approach this project, they had the, the requirement for two different kinds of uh, theatrical performance spaces. One kind of tradi more traditional concert hall, the other black box, was to think of each of these performance spaces as a kind of object. 
an object that was disturbing and distributed across the field in a loose, scattered, uh, almost um, informal manner or a formal manner. And this is the cyclone that we're looking at here. The river is to the top of the page, the, the hills and the, the smaller developments to the bottom. And in that, these two larger objects, I don't know if you can see the cursor or not, become the two performance spaces. And the rest of the site becomes a kind of landscape garden, almost the uh, foundations for a future inhabitation of a cultural center in commerce. Now, the, the project wanted to have two very different kinds of faces or frontages. The one that faced the street, which you would drive along uh, within its context of concrete plants and other industrial structures, was heavy and opaque. And it in itself was kind of solid. The two objects, though, would in their monolithic solidity, touch each other, kiss each other, just ever so briefly, forming an arch. And in that moment, the materiality of the, sh the recycled shingles, the slate shingles on the roof would transform and become the base to the other object. And the cast concrete would flip from base to top in uh, the kind of inverted fashion. This was also the arch in which you would first saw the rest of Kaunas, the historic town center across the river, and in which you would enter the project between these two heavy masses. And on the other side, the project transformed, became something very different. This was something we found in the Mexico City project as well, that one of the ways in which one could heighten the intensity of the solidity of the realness of a kind of monolithic heavy construction was by the abstraction of the glazing, the ways in which it cut, the ways in which abstraction and realism play off each other, not as uh, antithetical categories, but as ways in which they produce different aesthetic experiences, which allow you to see uh, each other, to pay attention to one or the other in different manners. So as you come under that arch and come to the river uh, embankment and to the river promenade, the building gets cut, gets sliced with these large abstracted out mirrored glazing um, figures, as if these figures are kind of floating abstractions within the heavy solidity of the, of the construction behind. It also binds the project into a moment where the two objects touch and cross over each other, meaning that the kissing moment, the arch moment, is also a bridge. It's also a moment in which the figure of one cut in its almost uh, iconic referentiality to the more historic structures across the river becomes blended in or bleeded into a horizontal um, scanning device from the other. Uh, massing of the main concert hall. And then it also frees a uh, figure, a kind of figural object that is the edge, which becomes a uh, restaurant, bar, offices, and stands out against the kind of um, background of the river as it's seen crossing and beneath the direction. So if we think of the plan, here's the two theaters. On the left is the black box theater that can be manipulated into multiple different formations. And on the right is the more traditional concert hall theater, which has an auditorium seating and a stage for performance. And the two of them are separate at this level. So we can see them in section, the upper section through the black box theater, the lower section through the uh, more traditional performance space. But at the level of the bridge, at the level of the arch, the level of the figural cut where the two buildings are bound together, they are connected and the circulation flows between them to create a single space. Now this allows both theaters to operate independently, but it also creates a kind of sequence of movement, the promenade that takes one under the arch, around the corner, up the stairs, into the lobby, up another set of stairs, into a bridge, which brings you finally to the overlook of the river from an upper level. So here's that sequence through a series of renderings. This is from the lobby looking up. The materiality on the outside inverts on the inside uh, so that the shingles begin to become internal articulations for these surfaces. This is the, the spiral staircase now from the bridge looking back towards the uh, theater of the black box. Here's the internal bar area overlooking the river and overlooking the promenade. Um, inside the shingled roof is the shingled roof turned inside out. 
the approaches to the primary uh, auditorium. The auditoriums themselves are viewed as or considered as boxes clad in curtains on the outside so that one would pass through the building, through the hollowness of a residual crochet into a curtain box. And that box was where the space of performance was. So here's looking down towards the stage, looking towards the stage, the, the side rails of the guardrails and the, and the balconies become thicker and thicker, uh, wider and wider to kind of abstract out the space of performance. And then looking back, they become thinner where you begin to see much more of the openness of the, uh, the lighting, the assembly, the walls, the curtaining, the acoustic uh, baffling systems that uh, frame the rest of the performance space. Now, a couple ideas about what we're looking at and thinking about with this. And this relates to a number of projects we've already shown. Um, we spend a great deal of time thinking about artists and particularly uh, um, photographers in many cases. These are a series of digital collages by the artist, uh, image maker, architect, Felix Scher. And in them, they possess a kind of incredibly strange quality of the abstractness of the figuration of the profile, which is then put in contrast with the monolithicity of this almost singular material, yet in highly realistic manner, image to become uh, uh, that surface, image to become that figure. So this is part of what we mean by the combination of abstraction and realism, is these are digital montages that are made from dozens and dozens of photographs put together. They are not digital renderings, they are literally uh, photo montages, but they are seamlessly melded to create uh, an appearance of a world, and you accept it as, at least at first glance, as being real. It is only some of the oddities, some of the abstractions that come into it. The figuration is one we're looking at. There's also a whole number of them that begin to raise doubt, to begin to allow you to question whether or not these are actually real things in the world. Um, Bas Prinsen is another photographer, photographer we're interested in, especially in this case. Uh, the mirror glass and the tint of the mirror glass and the ways in which the mirror glass itself makes the object become a kind of abstract intrusion into the reality of its site, causing attention to be diffracted and shifted to that site, to that context, to that uh, world around it. There's also a number of artists that have worked with this kind of technique. Um, Isamu Noguchi, cutting and polishing the, the stone in the sculptural um, motifs we're looking at so that at a certain level, it is a single material, but you're seeing it in very different manners based on whether or not you're looking at the cut polished surface or the rough, uh, more naturally hewn surface. Even more extreme are the sculptures of Ken Price, where here now, all the effort that has gone into the surface texturing, color patternation, uh, scumbling frame materialization of those surfaces, when cut, becomes incredibly abstract. In, uh, causes you to call uh, into doubt or question whether or not what you're looking at is a real object or not. And then there's this, which I don't know about you, but I saw Kuhan cool Luke fairly early on in my life, and it's been haunting me ever since. And there is just something, you know, about the fact that the mirrored glasses, you never see this character's eyes, by the way. And so in a way, you do not quite know if it is a real person. Because all that is ever given is the reflection back of the context that is around this person. Uh, the character actually uh, really speaks. But there's something in there. There's something in the combination of the abstraction of reflectivity as context spit back at you in the hardcore, uh, visceral, um, sometimes incredibly painful reality of the everyday in which these intrusions are jacked. Models were actually kind of a, a, a surprise to us and in, in, in many ways, I think, successful for the things we were thinking about and looking at. Uh, they're clad, the glazing with a dichroic film, and that dichroic film allows this sort of incredibly strange shift of attention of reflectivity and coloration as one moves around the model. But the model in itself uh, begins to escape its sort of digital uh, 3D printed fabrication in many ways, kind of similar to other uh, experiments we've done earlier with digital fabrication, 
Only in this case, kind of now pushing it up to a speculation of a large scale building. All right, here we are. This is going to be the last chapter. Um, so we participated in this competition uh, for the Bauhaus Museum in Dessau, um, open international competition, um, 900 plus entries, uh, two stage. Um, and this wasn't a competition uh, for the uh, this architecture collection. This was the competition for the entire Bauhaus collection, uh, which meant it involved all kinds of other practices and disciplines to which uh, Bauhaus explored um, you know, um, amazing ideas in the turn of the century, uh, 20th century, um, you know, ranging from textiles to objects to uh, costume designs and other explorations. Uh, but we were really kind of not interested in the uh, limited understanding of uh, what Bauhaus architecture was that defined a specific time and aesthetic. Uh, but we were interested in um, how, how these objects, how these uh, kind of uh, conditions that perhaps within the discipline architecture that uh, we have overlooked to affiliate with Bauhaus could kind of pave the way uh, towards a new thinking to reimagine uh, maybe a path that's more open-ended for the future of the Bauhaus uh, as an institution, but not frame it within kind of bounds of uh, how we understand, um, a, I guess, a very narrow genre of uh, you know what early modernist architecture is. Uh, not think about Bauhaus as a, a frozen legacy in time, uh, but something that begins to uh, kind of evolve uh, continuously. Um, so um, the Bauhaus has, uh, you know, the foundation has multiple buildings. Uh, the site that was given, I'm hoping you can see my cursor here. Um, Right here in the, uh, this is kind of uh, central park uh, of the city of Dessa. The site was an L-shaped site. Uh, basically, a corner of the public park uh, was given uh, as the competition site. Um, and that's the context into which uh, we entered what we called uh, the collective vessels. Um, the uh, idea was to, at least uh, from this view, kind of imagine uh, the building as a collective of collection of uh, kind of volumes um, as a kind of continuity of the park, not necessarily uh, staking a claim uh, that this is nature, but the nature of kind of assembly that begins to uh, kind of, uh, that we drive out, we draw out from our thinking that Bauhaus was never an ideology uh, of a single person, but it was kind of a collective effort of many interests that defined uh, a collective. But that kind of carried itself uh, as a strategy as a strategy to not only think to the building parts that meet the collective towards the whole, uh, but also in terms of the sequence and scale of how they organize themselves within the site in relationship to the elements that existed uh, within this park, so we did trees. Um, so the building is uh, a collection of uh, these vessels. These vessels um, kind of uh, come and find a plateau uh, at the first level, 15 feet uh, above the ground as a continuous uh, plane, uh, but then uh, kind of shift their geometry towards uh, a single column underneath each uh, module to touch the ground ever so lightly, allowing the uh, ground of the park to continue. And then uh, kind of scooping into, I, I guess, uh, narrowing down towards uh, what we call light scoops uh, to get in uh, natural light uh, through instances above. Uh, sometimes within modules, uh, um, there are uh, one or two uh, light scoops. And these modules begin to kind of couple either as pairs, triples, or sometimes as, uh, as fours, define different scales of uh, footprints uh, underneath um, underneath the, um, I guess uh, uh, we can call them domes, uh, underneath the roof, let's say. Um, each, each volume uh, is kind of uh, rendered in a different color. Uh, sometimes the colors move across the seams. Uh, they get far more amplified on the inside. But the uh, kind of interesting thing for us was, uh, as it was for the, some of the textile studies, Finding glitches, finding um, kind of ways in which um, kind of a very structured layout 
um, in this case the grid, uh, could be broken and be made very free uh, through a very organized geometry. We did that by um, kind of just playing with circles um, and with the way color operates um, on the on the surfaces. So all you have here is uh, straight lines and arcs. Um, everything is within a square grid, um, and these modules sit on a um, uh, circle uh, at their bases. And as they kind of intersect, they begin to erase uh, their overlaps to make either spaces uh, on the bottom uh, as amplot, where you go from uh, room to room to room, defining the permanent exhibition. Um, or uh, as they kind of uh, erase their overlaps on the top, making larger spaces uh, over uh, tall ceilings where uh, you inhabit more of a, a larger uh, space that's connected to an interrupted floor plane uh, where we have the um, changing exhibitions. Um, and the building basically never presents itself uh, as a whole uh, when you're at eye level in the city. It's always a collection of few things. There is kind of never a strong moment of um, um, something that uh, points to a large gesture in terms of what defines its uh, overall form. Um, there are parts in which um, colors begin to move across the vessel. Sometimes it's a uh, strain of color, sometimes it's strain of uh, texture streak that begins to move. But uh, it's always uh, a condition in which what we set up to be a condition of unity being undermined by way of how materiality and color begins to undermine uh, the same setup. So it's put into this tension of revealing and unrevealing uh, how it's made uh, and how it's coupled. And it kind of uh, presents, again, presents itself uh, as kind of a rhythmic structure uh, where these articulations of light scoops and columns begin to change orientations to establish you know, certain attitudes towards the street front in terms of uh, kind of uh, changing rhythm, um, or also towards the park uh, where it begins to get into dialogue, um, seen from the park where it begins to get into dialogue. Uh, with trees and elements where the ground flows uh, underneath uh, the projects. And as you enter the middle, the color kind of amplifies. Uh, this is a moment that you discover uh, within the building, within the park, uh, where you're separated from um, the elements of nature, let's say, uh, in this uh, fairly artificially uh, defined world of color that's uh, supported also by the flowering flower plants where the um, the columns touch uh, lightly down um, on the park level. Um, the color story is interesting. Um, we kind of talked to a company uh, here in Boston, uh, which is able to kind of uh, robotically sort color hues to reconstitute images that you can feed to them through a color palette. Um, so a kind of uh, image that is kind of uh, fed into the, let's say, the digital um, um, I guess, um, kind of uh, reading of the machine in terms of a realistic image being abstracted down to pixels and the size of the tiles, which then sorts the appropriate color to reconstitute the image uh, as sort of an abstraction. Um, and um, we kind of deployed that uh, in the overall building into foot by foot panels that would finally constitute uh, the configurations that uh, we explored within, uh, uh, within our. Um, digital tools. Um, here is the plan on the ground level. Uh, you see the how, how the columns can touch down on flower beds. Uh, park flows through it, diagonal access, defining both the entry to the museum, the service, back of the house on the left, uh, but making the connection from underneath the building in various ways uh, through, through it. Uh, then on the upper uh, upper floor plan, uh, you see kind of looping of the uh, linear fashion of the um, permanent gallery going from room to room to room as a linear sequence, um, auditorium, uh, the other educational spaces, um, and the bridge uh, in the middle uh, that, uh, that defines to be the cafe space, uh, which basically establishes connection. Uh, between the two volumes uh, that pitch them. So in elevation, uh, the building really presents itself um, kind of so stuck somewhere between a singular gesture uh, and, and parts. Uh, it doesn't take a claim about the expression of a singular, singular aggregate, 
nor it expresses itself as some kind of a um, kind of a I guess uh, quality of how um, aggregation uh, begins to define its architectural character. It's kind of ambiguous in the way um, it, uh, it it presents itself. But as you uh, kind of um, I guess section through this, there's a continuous floor plate that holds all the exhibition uh, program through which you can uh, move. The administration is suspended uh, on a mezzanine. Here is the entry sequence uh, as you go down under the project and uh, rise up uh, directly almost into one of those light scoops defining the moment of um, kind of going up uh, from the park space into the more kind of white exhibition space. This is the only moment where the color of the outside comes in and defines um, the kind of public collective moment outside of the exhibition. Uh, that is the cafe that looks uh, um, back down uh, into the park, both uh, at its entry towards a street corner, but also diagonally back at the park itself, defining the really only moment of uh, broad transparency uh, within the building, where the attention really shifts from uh, looking at the work uh, as a transitional moment between exhibitions uh, towards outside in the way the transparency operates, but also in the way the color from outside uh, comes in. And all these kinds of connections between the vessels and the way they alternate and rotate uh, around the center point of the circle begins to produce these uh, varying sectional moments. Um, because uh, that's kind of infinitely uh, kind of varied, the kind of sections you begin to get uh, as you move through also produce uh, these conditions that uh, one does not expect. Uh, basic assembly uh, of, the, of the layers, the park, uh, the plateau that establishes the entire floor and the vessel caps uh, that begin to come in. Um, we kind of imagine uh, this, uh, maybe just a little bit on the uh, uh, competition process here. Um, we're not really showing you the first stage of the competition images that um, we actually never ever show. Um, it's kind of a miracle uh, that somebody said, oh, that looks kind of interesting. Uh, let's carry this forward into the second stage. That has a lot of faith. Um, and um, in the second stage, um, you know, we kind of uh, were shortlisted down to 30. Um, and um, then finally, it was uh, brought down to two. Uh, and another, uh, I guess, stage of competition was invented at that moment, uh, where we really had to get into the you know, systems of how it would be constructed, how it would be made feasible, or structure work, uh, HVAC work, all that stuff. Um, but we kind of imagined like a, a concrete construction at the base to establish the uh, kind of plateau, uh, but above that, a very light uh, and off-site construction of uh, almost akin to egg crate construction of, um, um, I guess, laminated wood uh, construction that would be uh, kind of assembled off-site, but each, um, each vessel would be then uh, put into place above the plateau and connected uh, to the next one. Um, and of course, uh, this is kind of showing the full assembly of a hollowed columns, uh, concrete base, and the lightweight uh, wood construction on top with, uh, with the tile um, almost coming in as an application onto the surface uh, after um, the two parts are uh, on site assembled. Um, on the inside, uh, these individual vessels, as they connect, begin to produce these kinds of spaces where the attention goes into the light scoops up above, but also uh, in the way the uh, portals are established through the intersection between uh, connecting vessels. So your attention in some ways splits both ways, um, both towards the horizon, but also uh, towards the top. Um, so as you move from the project, move around the project, even though the character of the plan is almost always the same uh, as you look at it, um, the way uh, how these vessels kind of uh, hug, nestle, kind of, um, and orient themselves towards one another begins to acquire uh, varying qualities. Not one definite one, uh, but definitely si simultaneously uh, varying. It. There's the kind of... Um, Probably the largest exhibition space uh, we can think. Like the singularity of uh, what you see from outside begins to become maybe this is a combination of uh, four uh, 
uh, with an extra nozzle that begins to expand that understanding of the surface uh, where it unifies uh, on the inside. So um, we won, um, kind of. We were announced as the winner, uh, but then we learned there's uh, another winner, uh, and they couldn't be radically different uh, from one another. Obviously, um, this is kind of total opposite of how we view of what Bauhaus uh, could be to the future. Um, maybe uh, kind of different than um, how others felt. Uh, but for us, this perhaps shows a crisis of what an institution is and how it can evolve and what it can be. Um, after this, um, you know, um, the other scheme uh, went on uh, and got built. Um, and uh, that's the uh, that's the building that has been uh, that has been constructed. But we imagined uh, other our project didn't end here. Uh, our project kind of uh, imagined um, other other potentials uh, for its future as we continue to explore. So to kind of wind up our presentation today, if you remember the, the thing we started with was was a drawing that was really a painting that became a, a surface application onto a 3D printed object, which became photographed to become jacked into a 17th century Dutch still life. All projects have afterwards. All projects are in existence in multiple realities. So in 2037, the, the Dessau Electromagnetic Remediation Center was studied by a group of scientists led by Sina Boro Michidon and uh, Sina Ozuma uh, from the University of uh, uh, Micronesia. And one of the things that they were looking at was the intense amount of excess electromagnetic radiation which had been developed in Bessa. Uh, and the grove of trees that they planted around what was formerly a museum for the Bauhaus collection, um, had, which had to be decommissioned and then sent to a uh, glass box in Spain uh, because the, the radiation was damaging the artwork and its fragility and its historical nature, um, became something that they could tap into for uh, driving the growth of trees. So they invented these tree hybrids where they were half uh, mechanical, half natural, and they would take that radiation and expand and emit excess oxygen. And it was a way of taking a kind of social condition that had happened in, in these sort of temporary autonomous zones of uh, free Wi-Fi and use it to expand and to grow and deal with ecological conditions. Now, no one had really understood that this was, was going to happen when the first Bauhaus Museum was built. Um, and because of the experiments of this, of this group of scientists, this uh, grove, this forest, this uh, series of modules in a matrix began to be used for a very different kind of environment. In fact, the conical nature of the construction of the original Bauhaus tied with its surfacing of uh, recycled uh, centered glass allowed each of the vessels to become a kind of uh, oasis from excess electromagnetic radiation, a place where one could uh, go to remove oneself from the deluge of images as they were beginning to flood and overwhelm us in our daily lives. And uh, that was then submitted to Natura in 2037 as a scientific study of the ways in which energy and ecology and aesthetics begin to work together. Um, now, obviously 2037 is 2037 uh, and we're not quite there yet, but there's something that we wanna raise here as, as a kind of last thing to think about and to leave us with. And that's just that the projects are never done the moment that you submit them, the moment that you finish them. The projects as they exist in their life, in their afterlife, is part of their reality. And one of the things that we are incredibly interested in as architects is not just that moment where one signs off on a design, but on the fact that we are constantly speculating on near future realities through representations. This is really the work that we do as architects. This is our engagement with digital technology, our engagement with drawing, our engagement with modeling, our engagement with photography, our engagement with painting, our engagement with text is to try to imagine the ways in which the worlds we are thinking about become other and alternate than we assume them to be. And I think there's something important about that for us to remember as architects. We are involved in a near future lo-fi sci-fi 
uh, speculation. How can we be with each other on this planet in alternate manners? And what are the ways in which we can hopefully uh, imagine and think through the problems that are facing today by projecting into alternate aesthetic realities of the near future. Thank you. We're going to end there. Thank you so much, Michael and Kutan, uh, for a wonderful presentation. And I'd like to uh, start the conversation with the audience. If you have a question that you'd like to drop in the Q&A box, please do so, and I'll read it out. Um, otherwise, you can also use the raise hand tool and join the conversation on video with uh, Michael, Kutan, and myself. Um, Kutan and Michael, I realized today why I love your work. And it's, uh, you gave us a hint of that uh, in your cheeky introduction, uh, the awkward slipping of, in the DM with the Dada account <laughs> um, and the exchange that happened between you two. It's, it's such a clever way to introduce your ethos to the audience. and it, it really is consistent throughout in your work, built and unbuilt. Um, this is rather a, a comment than a question, but I guess my, my question is, how do you manage to introduce this strange object into an otherwise mundane or uh, familiar uh, construction technique or facade or uh, structural system? Um, how do you manage to introduce that specifically by convincing the client that this is something that could be useful to the project or to their aspirations behind the project? I'm sure a lot of your clients seek your work, particularly because they are, are also uh, fans of, of what you've done before. But um, oftentimes we find that, you know, clients that are, in, you know, again, my, my question is quite mundane <laughs> in a way, uh, but, but, you know, when, when a client seeks out an architect for a multi-story residential building, uh, they're looking after the KPIs and how much square footage is in each building. While in the beautiful example that you showed from Mexico, uh, you've kind of eaten away uh, some of the space inside by introducing these uh, really nice uh, protrusions into the facade. Um, so how, do you, how did you manage to convince the client uh, to do that? Um, in, in the case of the uh, Bauhaus Museum, I mean, your win, I, I still consider it a win, definitely, despite the two entries won, but it was a win for all of us, all the architects that are pushing for new ideas, particularly because most of us expected uh, something like the entry that actually got constructed to win, uh, but rather we saw something very unique and different and you know, a completely bizarre interpretation of what the Bauhaus is, um, but, but also uh, very, uh, you know, lovable in a way. Um, so how did you manage to get to that stage? You know, is my <laughs> question. So that's the overarching question. How did you convince clients to completely change their minds of what they've seen before and still manage to, you know, uh, build and, and uh, do your work uh, in the same uh, breath and the same repertoire? Well, there... Thank you, Riyadh. Those are, those are not mundane questions at all. Uh, they're super critical and important questions. And, and I think at a, and there, and there's, there's two different ways we can think about them and talk about them. Um, but I like the crossing relation that you made because at a certain level, uh, the client in Mexico had to be convinced that that, that that rather, um, exotic and strange intrusion of a window system of construction and, and uh, uh, in operation uh, would somehow make sense. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, and, but this, we had the same problem, actually, the same question with the Bauhaus. Now, how did we get to be one of two winners? I really don't know. I mean, like that's, that, we're going to have to ask the jury. We're going to have to ask whoever it was that, that uh, saw that through. We, I think we were lucky. Uh, honestly, um, to be in that situation. Uh, I mean, we tried to make our argument that this was was a within the lineage of the concept of the Bauhaus pedagogy, and part of that lineage would be to continually progress and experiment and and try to drive innovation towards um, alternate manners, and that that innovation would be held also within a kind of system of uh, constraints. And so for us. Uh, circles on a grid 
you know, like that's pretty, that's pretty straightforward. Circles on a grid, uh, modular construction that can be assembled off site and brought to the project. Um, but we just also took our aesthetics from the fact that these were workshops that were experimental workshops, which were uh, driving innovation in the ways in which we thought about color, abstraction, form making, um, uh, and technology. And, and so we, we were very uh, kind of aware and interested in what would be the next way to kind of play out that narrative. Um, uh, now, we somehow succeeded in convincing the client in Mexico and we did not succeed in convincing the client in uh, the Bauhaus. And, I, and that's something we've, we've thought about quite a bit since then. Um, and I, I don't want anybody to get the wrong impression. Uh, the architects that, that wander, they're great people. That architecture that they built is actually serving the needs of the Bauhaus um, in, in very specific manners. And that's probably the building they wanted. Um, but there was a moment there where we had an opportunity to convince them that they didn't know that they actually wanted this one <laughs> and that we had designed. And, and, and we uh, somehow didn't succeed there. And maybe that's just uh, also the kinds of realities of, uh, you know, sometimes you win and sometimes you don't. Um, but um, maybe Kutan would talk a little bit about the window in Mexico, because I think we learned something with the window in Mexico that if we were put into the situation of, of presenting again to the Bauhaus, we would go about it in a different way. And I think that's actually what you're asking about. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, it, it's interesting in uh, Mexico, I think um, the value of the project was the windows. Um, and we didn't say anything about anything else. Like that, that's the short answer. Like somehow um, finishes and other stuff um, that's more the background every day. They could be what they had to be, you know, uh, for the windows to be what, um, you know, what we wanted them to be. Um, and, um, so in, in some way, you know, every project is a little bit of a give and take. Um, you know, um, you can't, like, if you want everything all at once, and I think that's kind of what we did in, um, in Bauhaus, um, you know, and, there is no way to kind of pull the project, um, I, I, I guess, from the velocity that it was traveling at. Uh, you couldn't dial it back down without compromise. Um, and I think in Mexico, um, the compromise you could make uh, wouldn't alter the project. And we recognized that early on. Though that doesn't mean we kind of feared all along that somehow those windows that tilted out of plane would tilt right back in. And you would get probably potentially the ugliest building in the world, you know, <laughs> that that was always there. Um, so it, 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 it's not real. It's not there until it's there. And now it's there in concrete. It's pretty much there. Um, so um, but that that kind of understanding of what's what's important for the project um, at, um, you know, kind of uh, to what degree is to really recognize how we can present it and run it and uh, kind of, um, I, I guess, stick to it in some way. Um, and I think over the years, we kind of learned to do that a little better uh, just in terms of, um, you know, uh, for each project, what's at stake. And that's proving to be less about a um, maybe overarching ambition uh, of form and gesture. Um, and how that expressed itself, but really looking at uh, kind of more details and fragments and uh, episodes of a project uh, that begins to uh, build up um, kind of a assembly of an architectural effects. And in the case of that building in Mexico, the the strange object itself, which I mean, for me, it's that those modules that you know that make up the, the windows. They're composed of repeating elements. They're composed of these linear uh, uh, repeating wooden uh, elements that make up the ruled surface, right? So in, in their DNA, they're composed of mundane objects, but then the, the result is super complex and uh, very rewarding. Um, you know, the, even the finishing, I think, is just perfect for the building. Uh, the glazing is, 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 has an orange tint, but only at certain instances, right? That's, uh, so this is, it's tinted darkly, 
Mm. And so when it when it begins to appear orange, that's the moment where uh, the light outside and the light inside are beginning to compete. Yeah. So so here here you're now seeing the, the luminosity of the interior uh, lighting fixtures overwhelming the uh, exterior reflectivity. Yeah. Um, but you're but to just say one thing. Uh, this project went on hold for a period of time. And when this project went on hold for a period of time, it moved from this to this. Mm -hmm. And that made all the difference. The fact, and sometimes, I mean, this is, again, you know, it's like we're learning lessons that everybody has to relearn again and again and again. Um, but uh, when there was that pause, when there was that delay in the construction, uh, we were still allowed to experiment with the prototypes of the construction. And had we not had that time, had we not had that delay, I don't think the building would be as successful for us uh, as it is. Yeah, I mean, in many ways, uh, the whole process worked almost like a research project in the sense that, um, like, this small cup is in the uh, property of a much larger project down the street by the same client. Um, so basically used its backyard um, as R&D. Um, so we, we kind of cast these things and see how it works. Didn't work. Uh, try another method. Uh, I think this is uh, maybe the fourth, uh, fourth mock-up uh, of the cast, the most comprehensive one. Uh, but even within this, there were some mistakes that uh, we were trying to avoid. Um, but that process of slowing it down, the smaller one, kind of affording itself the space and time uh, for experimentation. Um, is kind of the outcome we're experiencing today. Um, but if it was like a, now look, it's a four story building in Dubai, you built that in like three weeks. Um, so you, you know what I mean? It's like slept for five days and that's kind of generous. Um, this, this project took a long time to build because of government changes, zoning interruptions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but that slowing down uh, afforded us the possibility to kind of explore the full potentials of what this could be. Right. Um, my last question before I give a room to the audience is, did you get a parking ticket on that prototype park in the parking spot? <laughs> <laughs> that <one. laughs> that's, that's an amazing yeah. thing. Uh, we we yeah. have a, you did take a, you did get a parking ticket. Okay. That, that, I, I hope it was worth it for the, <laughs> from the budget of the client. Uh, you can unshare your screen now and I'll read out some questions from the audience. Um, uh, Sui Lam, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, is asking, please recommend books that have affected your thinking or design processes. Hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, one of the things that's been interesting um, teaching this semester on Zoom, and then we're all in it, uh, is that I used to always recommend books uh, to my students and and I would I would have to uh, you know like kind of look them up online and do this and do that and now I can just go say I can say well everybody should know this book translations from drawing to building by Robin Evans uh, and, and so anyways you get the gist uh, since since I got my library behind me um, you can you can do this uh, I'd, I'd say. Um, for me, other other books that have been uh, kind of just crucial uh, is Privacy and Publicity, written by Beatrice Colomina. Um, the uh, the writings of Walter Benjamin, uh, especially the, the work of art in the age of its uh, mechanical reproduction. Um, you, you know, it's like you just kind of start scrolling through and saying, "Oh yeah, that one, and yeah, and that yeah, that one, that one too." <laughs> uh, but um, I, I, th I think I, I think for us, there's been in terms of the the sort of research and, and writing and thinking we do, we're as much within um, the traditions of, of aesthetic speculations in art and philosophy uh, as we are in in the sciences, and and especially we're we're kind of dedicated to experiments within representation. And so, so Robin Evans, Mario Carpo, uh, the, these are uh, kind of crucial touchstones for us. Yeah, I'm I'm going through rereading um, you know, complexity and contradiction 
Um, and uh, it's delightful to read it after like so many years again. Mm. Um, and also uh, Coli City. Um, th- th- there is something in that material I think resonates with us, not necessarily um, directly through its um, um, aesthetics, but through some of its operations, I, I think are embedded in the work um, that are perhaps more indirect, uh, but I, I think the knowledge they produce and suggest are, uh, are, are definitely there. Um, so yeah, it's a kind of, it's kind of rediscoveries right now that I would highly recommend revisit. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned some classics as well, uh, that every architecture student should read. Definitely. Um, we have a question here from Hadil who's asking, how has your exploration of new methods of representation of architecture and objects influenced your approach to coming up with design concepts for architectural projects on the ground? Uh, one of my former colleagues at the Cooper Union, Levius Woods, had this uh, statement that he said. He said, any architect that he ever fell in love with in his life, um, that architect initially initially proposed their project through the questioning of representation. And uh, I think there's something in that. And, and I think it has to do with the fact that our daily practice as architects is through modes of representation, technologies of mediation. Uh, and those are, are massively important disciplinary concerns. There, there's another thing that we like to say that one is disciplined into the discipline through representation. And that that is, those conventions are kind of what is passed on from generation to generation. Now that means that those conventions are not stable. They should be challenged. They should be questioned. They should be investigated. They should be pushed against uh, to try to, to try to see what other possibilities, what other alternatives, and to sometimes expose the biases that are, that are latent within them. I mean, this is, as important now as it's always been important, but it, it's you know it kind of continually comes to our attention just exactly how biased certain conventions we operate within are. Um, now, in that, I think that there's there's an assumption sometimes that all representations are ultimately uh, to lead towards the building. Um, I think we would we would take the position that the building is one among many representations. One among many mediations, if that's a little bit better than the word representation, uh, of which all of these other things we work in are, are equally important. Um, and, and do we want to build? I mean, let's be clear. Yeah, absolutely. We want to build. That's, that's like we're architects. That's uh, absolutely part of what we're after. But we don't view that any of them are more real than, than the other one in terms of the speculations that we're trying to, to develop. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think on that note, um, the kind of practice we um, kind of always imagined for ourselves, um, it's something that we wanted to engage in um, as a kind of creative cultural practice, um, was to be kind of free in it, you know? Um, like in some way, have the freedom to think experiment and explore and now like michael said what you do daily is not you're not building buildings that's not our job uh, our job is to kind of get what's in here out into the world uh, through mediation and that mediation takes all kinds of different forms and formats uh, and modes um, and i think one uh, important aspect in the way perhaps we try to do this not in drawings, not in models, not in objects, not in um, um, installations or buildings. The tech, the specific technology how that's, uh, that is enabled, that is made, let, let's say, um, real, physical, uh, or brought to world, um, is not the primary concern for us. We recognize we operate through that. We operate through the emerging technologies. But for us, uh, the kind of idealism uh, of that tool, that technology is not primary at all. Um, and I think whatever it may be, it might be that through which we put ideas uh, to the table, somewhere like suppresses uh, the tool uh, to the extent that's possible to open up um, kind of different readings. And 
that's kind of our goal to, I guess, our ambition to push it more towards uh, uh, a kind of uh, aesthetics of the doubts uh, through the way it's mediated. Um, so it's for us, it plays a central role in terms of how we think about the project, how it's pushed out into the world um, in, um, in various mediums. Uh, but it certainly is trying to sub suppress certain things to play out uh, certain other effects and qualities. Adil has another uh, question. She's asking, do you often speculate about a strange afterlife of the project during the early design stages in a way that somehow informed the final form? And does the real context of the project play an equal part or are projects viewed as estranged objects? I know that's a great question. I'll take the first part. Um, I'm currently teaching a studio um, where we're speculating, um, you know, in two successive stages to 2040 and 2060. But the early parts of the project uh, made decisions about the future. Uh, now we're dealing with its present. Um, I think it's super important for a designer to kind of situate, uh, you know, himself or herself out of the present um, and play out scenarios. And not always, let's say, positive scenarios. Like contemplate where it might fail because how you imagine it might fail might push you to make other set of decisions uh, at the present. Because I think in some way we all carry our present biases in the projects and claim it to be the kind of ultimate solution or ultimate reaction uh, to a brief. Uh, but to contemplate uh, that uh, is a displacement from a current moment. Uh, might you know push one to design in very different ways so in some way for for us i think in the way we practice and teach it's a tool to overcome our biases towards uh, our present positions yeah that's a good point i mean we're i think both of us I mean, both of us teach um and we've taught ever since our firm has existed and so the teaching uh studios and seminars and lectures are all kind of woven into how we think about what we do. And I guess it's just to say, we never run a studio as if a studio is an atelier extension of our practice. Um, the studios are run to challenge ourselves, to, tell, to try to think about and explore things we don't know anything about. Um, so that that is, uh, I mean, I, it's just kind of thought about the ways in which these things relate together. Context, I would say to the question, it's a very good question. Context is always constructive. Um, and so it's not, it's not like there's real context and fake context. Context is constructed socially, technologically, aesthetically, physically. Um, and one of the things we do as architects when we start a project, um, is we construct that context through representation so that we can intervene in it. And, uh, thus to the question of estrangement, uh, estrangement defamiliarization requires that one um, constructs and works within that which is understood to be the familiar. And I think this is, this is an important point. It's not about making a weird thing. It, it's, it's actually about making the things you think are not weird become weird. Uh, making that which you've overlooked become looked at. Uh, taking what is banal and, and exposing its banality as, uh, uh, completely absurd. Uh, and, and so, we like questions like that. Um, and, and architecture, I think, is a great vehicle for these kinds of explorations because it is, uh, you know, as, as the Walter Benjamin quote is, it's consumed in a state of uh, distraction habitually. We walk by it all the time and don't even pay attention to it. And, and yet it is establishing the ways in which we assume reality to look. Uh, so this is, this is the hardcore, big time political question. Um, and if you can alter that or shift attention or make that which is familiar begin to become other, strange or, or different, then you're, you're working through aesthetics to begin to challenge political um, assumptions, create political effects. Uh, so that's how we, I think we view, you know, that there's sometimes because we, there's this book, The Strange Object, that we put out. Um, it's not about the object being strange. It's, it's about, what it does to the world around it that is its, it's uh, effective estrangement, if that, if that makes sense. We can talk about it more. 
No, it makes perfect sense. And I think you showed great examples of how you've applied that thinking in your work. I think that's a great note to end on. So uh, Michael and Kutan, thank you so much for joining us on Live Academy today. And thanks for your sharing for sharing your work and your ideas uh, on our platform. Uh, thanks uh, again, Young and Ayata, for joining us uh, today. If you have any last words to share with our uh, audience. Happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Always excited to share the work uh, and have an audience. But uh, thanks for the invitation. Great. And hope we can connect in person sometime in the near future. Absolutely. See you guys.